20 minutes. Think about that. Playing for 20 minutes, non-stop. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to start the mic again. The holy mic, the Canadian mic, the mic of truth. Mike and Mike Bob and Ray. Bob and Ray. I haven't mentioned them in a long time. Yeah, I haven't mentioned them. Talk All about right. them. So we're coming off well, after the second. Bob and Ray and Ted I'm Allen. giving this man over here a chance to realize that I'm not here until he decides to come up here because he's the first one leaving things off. Uh, Isn't that right? Uh, David, am I right? Is that uh, 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 so um, if you have never heard this person, you're about to hear this person. And like I like to say about him, there are things that he puts into my brain. You want to read? Yes, please. No. Sorry for being here. Uh, I'm only kidding. I just, Alan Harrison in there. I'm going to give him a round of applause. Bring him up here. Or bring him up there, actually, because I'm over here. My nose, thank you. Uh, 21. Hi. Uh, I'd like to start with a haiku. What? All right. Um, Stuck on the freeway, life is just passing me by. No, wait, those are cars. <laughs> a satellite photo of a hot chocolate gets me thinking about how toilets are outlawed in Connecticut. Soon my hallucinations are having kittens. Like, I meet my paternal grandfather when he was the age that I am now. He owns a very profitable hay braiding shop in Vladivostok and offers to teach me the business. Like, a sociopathic stallion represents me in court when I brought up on charges of trying to sell Texas to an extraterrestrial. <laughs> like, a blues playing Singapore sling sidles up to me and sticks its mint spatula in my ear. Like, I marry a rewind button. Like, I tell Keith Richards that he looks healthy. Like, I torture some chili beans and they scream for help, but I just laugh and order a pizza. Like, disappointed mushrooms appear on Oprah, like Jock Itch wins an Oscar, like rats turn out to be very small, hairy Republicans with terrible eating habits, <laughs> like someone opens a Burger King on my left eye. <laughs> Finally, I scorch Brooklyn porcelain. Immediately, all of my muscles testify. The tiles before my eyes melt and reform as the face of God. Chrome fixtures are born again. A urinal cake ascends to heaven. A condom machine takes a vow of chastity. And I become pastor of the Church of the Empty Bladder. Millions join my flock, and together we, we give thanks for the miracle of whizzing. And that is why I say to you that you should put away your Bibles, put away your Torahs, put away your Korans, and let us pray, let us sing, let us urinate. So that together we will all be in God's eyes. Empty bladders. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is something new I wrote, and I, and I apologize in advance. Thank you. We'll hold you to that. I'm trying an experiment. I'm, sitting, I'm setting the timer on my iPhone for 15 minutes and then writing nonstop for that amount of time. Just keep writing. Never take the pen off the page. Just keep writing. Even if I can't think of anything to write, just keep writing. Even if I just keep writing the phrase, just keep writing over and over again. Boy, will that make a great poem. All work and no play makes Alan a dull boy. No, wait, that's been done. Just keep writing. Let whatever is in my head just spill, spill out out onto the page. No, wait a minute. Are you kidding? I mean, are you sure about this? Do you have any idea of what is in there? Are you at all aware of the sick and twisted shit that is contained within the receptacle known as Alan's mind? The depraved ideas that would make the thoughts in Charles Manson's head seem like a letter from the Pope? Do you really want those cerebral etchings from the psyche of a madman to be let loose? This was a terrible idea. I could be unleashing forces that might very well change the world in horrible and irrevocable ways. I need to stop this. I need to put the depraved cork back in the bottle. I need to put the sick and twisted toothpaste back into the tube. I need to shut, lock, and board up the door to my mind. Go back to writing the kind of glib nonsense that people will forget about two minutes after I've read it to them. Fear, inhibitions, short attention span, all the things that keep me 
be psychologically constipated are there for a reason. Let others create true and lasting art by tapping into the deepest, darkest recesses of their minds, by plumbing the depths of their subconscious, by burrow, burrowing down until they find themselves face to face with the core of their very being. I need to just write my little jokes, make my superficial observations, do whatever it takes to keep the living, breathing, shaking, squirming, flexing, preening, pulsating, gyrating, pogoing, jitterbugging, jack jumping, show stopping evil within me from ever seeing the light of day. Put down the pen. Put down the pen. Drop the pen. Drop the pen. Just stop writing. <laughs> Oh, yeah, there we go. Melissa Mel is coming up there. Give her a round. Hey, Sam, poet, a person of fame knows wit and wisdom. She laughs, but, you know, it's all true. I, mean, I would never lie to anybody. Do you have any that can take the voice <laughs> I wasn't even going to read, but thank you for... Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to hear your voice. This is my most recent poem. One. Oh, that's good. There, I got it. I'm an audio engineer, but I study in college. I know. <laughs> One. When I was a girl, my grandmother went with me. She took trips to Florida and brought me back gifts. A plastic toy alligator I played with in the bath and a plastic baggie containing a starfish. The insert read, sea stars aren't really fish. And I dropped it kicked it right under my bed where my cat, Zephyr, immediately dove and ate it. <laughs> Two. From my great-great-grandmother, I inherited the skull of a, of a catfish shaped like a crucifix. When shaken gently, there was a rattle of calcium stones in the hollows where the ears once were. I remember perching it upon a shelf in an empty bedroom next to the fragile emerald carapace of a dead cicada in part of the squirrel jawbone teeth intact. Three. I dreamt of a past lover again last night. She pushed through a sea of people to get to me, and she said, mine, and I glimpsed a hunger in her teeth like a shark's as she smiled before she kissed me. I woke, sore cage rattled and bitten. Four. You recently asked me if I'd want to be a shark using electroreception to detect nerve, to detect Nerve impulses hearing low frequency hums discharged by dying fish or dolphins <coughs> emitting sound waves from an organ called melon, the teeth acting as antennas to receive the echoing back from the sea. And I answer dolphin, and you should know that yes, it is for pleasure, and it is also because you make my teeth pulse, and it is also because I've grown bone tired of fishing <coughs> blindly for heartbeats and open seas. No echoing. <coughs> Five. The sea star has a vascular system of salt water rather than blood. Imagine what it must feel like to be completely filled with the very molecules that surround you. the vastness of the desert, he said, the way the sky opens up, stars poised like so many dust particles in a beam of light at dawn or dusk. And it is more aromatic than desolate, a sharp, sweet shrapnel smell when the rain comes, oily like leather, like tobacco bitter pungencies. I pick up earth, bones and bullets, a mother bunch for the sensing. To render barrenness is to deny a cusp, a wing, and a sadness deep as canyons run is no excuse for death. A quick plasma pop sends embers shooting into ash, where fire once flickered as necessity, entranced onlookers heartily asked respect. <laughs> there are now greedy screens, irreverently beaming thieves. Rusted hatchet blade on splintered wooden handle rests among boxes of kindling. We are not built solely for city living. 
safety is the riptide breath of a slumbering dog, the tinny whistle of a hummingbird, every corpse pose and inevitable ending, a part of a gun. Fragility falls off like a band-aid on what skin if you let it. You hold on to your saguaro boot canteen by its dead woody ribs and drink. This is um, a poem by Audre Lorde. It's called Oh to Me for Survival. It feels appropriate since I wasn't going to read and then I decided to anyway. So, um, what was it called again? A Litany for Survival. I'll write it down on the thing. Yeah, yeah. I'll... For those of us who live at the shoreline, standing upon the constant edges of decision, crucial and alone, for those of us who cannot indul indulge the passing dreams of choice, who love in doorways coming and going in the hours between dawns, looking inward and outward at once before and after, seeking a now that can breed futures like bread in our children's mouths <laughs> so their dreams will not reflect the death of ours. For those of us who are imprinted with fear like a faint line in the center of our foreheads, learning to be afraid with our mother's milk, for by this weapon, this illusion of some safety to be found, the heavy-footed hope to silence us. For all of us, this instant and this triumph, we were never meant to survive. And when the sun rises, we are afraid it might not remain. When the sun sets, we are afraid it might not rise in the morning. When our stomachs are full, we are afraid of indigestion. When our stomachs are empty, we are afraid we may never eat again. When we are loved, we are afraid love will vanish. When we are alone, we are afraid love will never return. And when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak remembering we were never meant to survive. Mark, you're up. Mark? Mark? No, wait a minute. Hold on. You're, this is your first time here, right? Yeah. Oh! Well, 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 welcome in! Ah! I was here in Haiti. Oh, yeah, well, well, yeah, now, okay. That, that's 30 yeah. years ago now. <laughs> we have a new tradition. You're, you're, you're kind of, well, you're not so, legally, yeah, especially right? new. Yes. Uh, I... I I've seldom ran for the last like 20 or so years, and I went to uh, Hate Library dance at over here someday, so that was about a year ago. Okay. Um, this one is called Honk, 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 Ooh Wee, Ooh Wee. <laughs> Just maybe, among us abide ascended masters who by cocked ear and sacred spanner, in ten motorcycle exhausts, pitched to trigger parked <laughs> car alarms, while I wanted to be soft. Yet so much more elevate my heart, if purely by coincidence. <laughs> um, this is from January 1996, it was a different time. I put on, I am a bomb. I put on my eyes, my bomb eyes, and I launch myself into the air, sitting in my living room naked. I'm a Tardin consultant, paid by the hour with a bonus for accuracy and time and a half for overtime. I have one hand on my joystick and another on my crotch. Because I like this. Because of the kinesthetic qualities and every minute I'm getting paid. The head company takes 25% off the top. I do my job well. I produce. I'm another service market worker in a free market economy. <laughs> I got my own apartment. I got my car. Black leather cyberspace chair. I refrigerate full smart drugs. All quality. All legal. I wish I had a cock to put a face on. 
couldn't rig a jack for girls. Some of the guys got a face from tech for the shoulder missions. They have to stay hard all the time. They say it's not too difficult. I got big legs, but I'm popular with the guiders in the C3I human guidance system. I made it with some Jason. I imagine that was a target. And he was a, one of those big Dionysus series, multi-stage, intercontinental. I got wet to say in my mind. I told him I wanted it rough. He was too tender. We fucked it up for each other. Both ashamed not to feel satisfied. This was the last time I saw him. I'm Spike AP today. A needle. Accounts payable. I'm short-range anti-personnel. I feel it. <laughs> the way I move, I don't need to check the status is by the tell. There's no jack officer along for the ride today. I'm up alone. Looks like I'm on a local off. I see my apartment block. I wonder what I'd see if I got it myself there. Maybe that's what happened to Jason. Just to find out. I'm crossing over looking for intercepts. Got my hand on the button. It always comes to this. It's not too far. I see the crosshairs and the z-axis. I switch to the right visual to infrared. I'm getting hot. There's no interference. We must be working for police today. I scan and close them fast. I read three heat sources in close quarters. They must be disconnects for folks. To have the heat sent after them. I don't care. I watch the video. The human is a guided animal. I'm starting to come. I'm coming after them. They'll never know what hit them. No quarter. Jason taught me this trick. Right before impact. Switch off the guidance channel. Increase the bandwidth for visual. I have a deck on for high speed recording. Get the last seconds. Have it loop for a while. After the white space. Keep the afterglow. Loop. Loop. The last seconds. Look for details. It's just gone. It's gone now. It's white. Come in. It's here. It's gone. It's white. It's here. I'm there. I'm here. It's white. I'm coming. I'm hot. I got the tape. I took my legs. It loops. It loops. It loops. Until I turn it off, I mark a kill on my time sheet. My cunt's buzzing. I get up to wash my hands, take a break, get back to my job. I'm good at this, so I'll get my bonus. Sit back down. The governor gives me another ride. I'm a bomb. I put on my eyes. My bomb eyes. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Welcome, welcome back. And um, Brittany, we gave you a little bit of a welcome. You're off. Yeah. Brittany, give her a round of applause. Yeah. Is this your, is this your debut here? First time. You are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. You have a right to be here. From yeah. the, the, the yeah. 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 Okay. It's not so bad up here. We keep the sharks in the back, just and we don't we don't throw anything either. Oh, no, no that's throwing. Nice. That's nice. I'm going to go. Okay. All right. You guys ready? Yes, we are. Okay. So this is called uh, Bluer Than Black. I actually haven't read this out loud before. It's something like this. So you guys are my first ones. Okay. Um, I once lived in a house darker than the color black, so dark it looked blue. This house was just a block of concrete and cement. There were no windows to cast the outside world shadow. It was not a prison or a jail or a sanctuary or a haven. This house was just a block. It had a table and a kitchen and a floor, but it didn't have a door. It had a crack in the wall so deep I could creep in and out. There was a clock in the kitchen that was always three hours late. When it ticked, the whole house would echo and hiss. The concrete was unstable and still damp, so the house would shift. With the wind and the rain, it was at the mercy of nature, and it hated it. I hated it. Eventually, it collapsed. 
this house was just a pile of blue rubble. I then moved to a house brighter than the color yellow. It had several transparent doors on the outside. This house was just a window of the world. It was too exposed and too vulnerable, weak and open. It wasn't sturdy like a block. It was fragile like a bone that cracked and fractured under pressure. So I built my own house, five feet, five inches to only fit me. It only had one door and one window, but that was all I required. I built it near the glass beach I used to go to when I was younger, where the salty wind scorched my face and the sun stained my skin. I used to play in the dirty, foamy waves with a sky that wasn't cobalt, sapphire, or midnight blue. It was just blue, bluer than black. I painted my house with a mixture of yellow, blue, and black. I put locks and deadbolts on the door. This was not a house, but my home. Three more minutes. I got three minutes, should I? I mean, well, you know, yeah. something in life, you know, something share. Something Okay, well, this is like a free ride. I mean, I did the other day. You guys want to? Yeah. Yep. Why not? Okay. Why not? Okay. Why not? Okay. Raw, okay. new, let's go. It's a beloved. Oh, okay, okay, this one's, this one's a one. Okay, uh, okay. I am you and you are me, connected tethered to the nothingness, yet to the everything that is us. You, we are finite, yes, or are we infinite? Our flickering souls may continue to. Uh, emit life forever and ever, but one may ask, what is forever? And then I ponder the contradiction that we, as finite beings, may not be able to fathom this fabricated forever. The strings and bonds and ropes that tie us to our humanity are frayed, frayed to everyone's dismay. They think this is a game to play, created for them with rules, boundaries, and codes, but for us there is no order. To think there is ever order is to be a fool. To think that somehow balances and scales weigh in your favor due to some duty or obligation you have to the universe is bullshit. You are alone. But that is not a bad thing. These naive sheltered strings and bonds that tie you to your humanity is a lie. You are nothing while at the same time you are everything. Uh, nothing as in the silence you feel when you don't know yourself. Nothing as the blackness that falls on that lonely night. Nothing that engulfs the skies when you realize those stars are lies. Nothing that sucks the light out of your eyes. Nothing as the instance you realize you are made of dust, as when the mighty sea washes and seals away all the work and perseverance of the sand. Nothing as in the moment that twink that the nothing is in the moment that twinkle of life, that glimmer of hope that leaves your eyes and evaporates into the emptiness. Nothing as the moment when you say freedom. Uh, everything when the moment you realize your soul, atoms, dust, and your stars have become intertwined with another's, this is when you can or may truly experience the everything. Everything when you are truly and undeniably loved. Everything when you stare out in the night sky, stars, a glimmering, moons, a shining, all seeming perfectly aligned. And when that sudden calm comes over you, and then that moment is when you realize you and the universe are everything, and you share all that is alive and dead. Everything in the instance when you come to understand that you are the universe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Antoinette. Antoinette. Wonderful. Give her a round as she comes up here, please. And please. And Clyde always here. Now. Oh, it's the mini feature, yes. The mini, right. mini. Yes, thank you. The maxi right. mini. 1975. Taking the corner too fast, passenger door unhinged, flew open at the curve, leaning into the road she held on, laughing hard. They smoked weed at rush hour, oblivious to long, angry horns and glares that did not lessen the joy of hot summer wind up her skirt. Recording. Look deep at tapestry, prism faceted, varied threads all lead to an event. Never finish, there is more, interwoven thought, action, end. Circle holds death, in between we are bound. Addictions lay in food, alcohol, drugs, sex, consumptions carry to brief release. 
Perverse course driven attic once more. Child is raped, murdered, not in this world. She rests before moving on. Cold feet had less meaning since faith in the impossible. Sorry. <laughs> I need glasses. I'll start again then. Okay. Yeah. Faith in the. Um, sorry. Cold feet had less meaning since faith in the impossible swelled in her heart. She walked without shoes in the, st in the snow until another's warm heart claimed her own. Slipping out of the cold into a used bookstore, their kisses fogged windows from behind shelves of nautical inspiration. Aged thin skin like cellophane wrapped bones and veins yearned for gloves to contain her joy. Turning somersaults in an office meeting, her thick thighs beneath small red berry print pulled everyone's attention. Bigger than the rest, her song formed huge soft bubble, delight in every cell, spectators laugh. Later, dancing on the ladder with fellow sopranos captured massive curves swinging high in a gray wool skirt. She saw girth of little consequence, matter of character, mind's final footing, a conspirator's dance for adipose. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A new regular person. All right, let me just look at the list here. My co-pilot is co-piloting. All right, so we have... Oh, uh, <clears throat> I, much of what I said about Alan Harris if you remember my brief introduction to him, applies to this next individual here, our mini feature of the evening. Will Clyde always kindly come forward, please? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, come on, come on, come on, step right up. Folks want to grab you on some of our roads, even hold on. And they're going fast. You don't want to miss this. It's time for another exciting installment of the Clyde. Always showing me you're always clever, always handsome, always charming, host Clyde. Always, and I ain't no common carnival barker, I am. The Bard, the bard of, of the Lower, lower hate. And this is the tale of my Uncle Dan. When I was just a tender lad, about the age of eight, I'd stay up past my mom and dad and count my worries late. But one such night while tucked in bed, I jumped to spy a man who through my open window said, I am your Uncle Dan. I know you your entire life. I know the way you are. I know your struggles, pain, and strife. I've seen it from afar. And so I traveled here this fall across the countryside. I bounded over mountains tall and border rivers wide. I came so you could lighten up and love the guy who be. But first I need to fill my cup. It's empty, you can see. And I'm super hungry, too, my uncle did declare. I'll cook a mighty feast for you, a banquet we can share. And so my uncle Dan cracks a egg and made a room. He piled meats and cases stacked and ladled out the stew. Sorry. Zinger. We gobbled golf and gladly ate. We smiled as we chewed. And Uncle Dan refilled his plate and polished off the food. At last we laid our heads to rest. The dish is still a mess. I worried Mom, she'd beat her chest. She'd roar and I confess. But Uncle Dan, he woke before the folks could start the day. He yanked me up and off the floor and we were on our way. Well, Uncle Dan, I shouted out, just where are we to go? I'm taking you to see the trout. There's something you should know. He led me to a little farm at morning's breaking gleam to view a sight of little charm and artifact. Stream. The fish within were flapping hard. They fought for every stroke, but most they barely moved a yard before their spirits broke. And Uncle Dan, he pointed to a single hardy fish and said, that's what the wisest do of happiness and wish. You see how hard he fights the blast. He never stops his fans. He knows he's getting nowhere fast, and yet 
and swims and grins. Now come with me, said Uncle Dan, to yonder rubbish heap. Perhaps we'll meet a garbage man to sell us something cheap. The dump was full of junk and flies. A stench was in the air when tractor tires caught my eyes. And Uncle Dan, do we dare to roll this tire down the street and see how far it goes? But Uncle Dan, I stopped my that's where the traffic flows. But Uncle Dan was worried not to bid that tire by. It rolled a straight and narrow shot to where the truckers fly. The tire bounced, the tire crashed, it gained tremendous speed. Along the way, I nearly crashed my pants. I nearly peed. I bet it's rolling even now along some dusty road, perhaps in Timbuktu, Macau, or sunny Mexico. It's time I go, my uncle said. But remember something, son. There's time for fretting when you're dead. This life's for having fun. And then my uncle Dan was gone as quickly as he came. That told me must have moseyed on, and then I did the same. Before my folks I had to stand, I rate it seemed to me. And I held my jaw quite squarely and proceeded to come clean. Admitting all with guilt, I sang, and all my mouth had rang. I wondered if for this I'd hang when Mom said, Uncle Dan? <laughs> you lying snake, said Pop. A shame, as Mom collapsed in tears. Dan's her only brother's name. He's been dead for years. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a little Broadway number going out to all the millennials in the house. Right. It's called Life Literally Annoying. Oh, no. <laughs> like literally, he was dumb as a turkey. Like literally, he would bray like a mule. Like literally, <laughs> put a brick in a jerky. He's a literal shit show, an asshole or two. Like literally, he was driving me crazy. Like literally, he was getting my goat. Like literally, I was Martin Scorsese and literally jump like right down his throat. Now literally, he's asleep with the fishes. Now literally, I'm just so full of beans. Now literally, we got all of our wishes for half stout nuts, but I literally mean. <laughs> Another personal anecdote for you, all about how I gave back to society. And it's entitled, Clyde Always Gives Back to Society. <laughs> nice <What>? title. Hey. <laughs> so I was going to organize a huge human rights rally. And it was going to be the greatest human rights rally in all of history. But I needed a web page and a face space. We had to tweet all about it. So I got out my smartphone to get started. But then it occurred to me that my smartphone had been assembled by eight-year-old Chinese children. So that put the kibosh on that, and I still had to do something to feel good about myself. Because what can I say? I'm selfless. So I went to the soup kitchen, and I got a bowl of soup, and I pondered ways I could help people. Now, it seemed to me that folks were in most dire need of four, count on four basic necessities. Those being spare change, cigarettes, crystal meth, and malt liquor. These are the things they're paying for in the soups anyway, so then I had in it. <laughs> then I went to the bank and I withdrew 1,000 rolls of pennies. Then I used my Safeway Club card to rake in the savings on their entire stock of steel reserve. Then I drove all night in the rain. Then I carved upon carbon of tax free cigarettes from the Native Americans. Then I called in a big favor from my Uncle Dan. The next day I was trying to get back to society. That dawn on the corner of O'Farrell and Leatherwood. I stunned the streets with chunks of meth crystals and get back to ventilated cigarettes. And then I took of like they were Easter eggs. Then from the roof of a tall building, I that we can only describe as a little little water slide with an inflatable wading pool full of it at the bottom. Then they begin to flock. The poor, the needy, the destitute, the toothless. Masses swarmed in like hungry locusts. And they had on the treasure they found and bathed in beer like it was the fountain of youth. I watched in a reverie. As I cut little nicks in the penny rolls with a razor blade, ah, then I slid on the slide while bombarding them with my own handmade spare change grenades. Pow, 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 pow. <laughs> they came out like children grabbing up candies at parades. Then they lifted me to their shoulders like I was Robin Hood, and they, my merry men, and the stacking pictures faded away 
the fingers unclogged and the boils melted like popsicles in the sun, and the rags became three-piece suits, and the bindles became Santa like briefcases, and the doorways and overpasses morphed into multi-million dollar mansions, and the fast food chains and donut shops became three-star Michelin rated restaurants, and the CEOs of major corporations threw themselves from top story windows as the president abdicated his duties, and money became nothing more than useless chips of paper, and all the national borders were officially dissolved, and world peace was all there was. <laughs> and that's when he appeared to me, descending down from the open heaven on a chariot of light, the cheerful bearded face of the man in the sky, none other than John Lennon. <laughs> and he spoke to me. He whispered in my ear, he said, And I said, Fuck it, Johnny! Thanks for listening, everybody. Tune in next time. Can I do two plugs? Oh, I still got three minutes? Yeah, okay, cool. The beaver went off crazily. So. Wow. Okay. Um, well, then, how about a fucking encore? All right. All right, there you go. Um, a few things important to tell you. Well, one, uh, actually, I'm on the lamb right now because, and I'm too old to be doing shit like this, but I almost got apprehended <laughs> by a fair bear this morning on the number five bus, but I turned tail and ran for the hills. So whatever you do, oh, oh. never mind. Finish it. Whatever you do, yeah, the people who want the, they want to check the tail. Oh, anyway, that's, that's what they are. are. On the lamb, so we're trying to lay low, but. I like a gay bear who's like, Oh, no, 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 the, the oh, people yeah. who checked your tickets, I had no tickets, so I had to run away. Run away. Anyway, you, you didn't need to know any of that. I'm just, I'm just yeah, stalling for time here, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Wait, but uh, no, I got, I got a show coming up. It's at the North Beach Library. I've got flyers to give you, and uh, it would be my pleasure to see you there, and that would be so nice if you could come, because it's a free show. Uh, I'm going to do 25 minutes, so anyway. Um, <laughs> Just really quick, I'll end on this uh, little tiny poem for you. Uh, it's called Regan the Militant Vegan. <laughs> you may have met on Hippie Hill a stinker name of Regan, who'd always preach and blather shrill how much he was a vegan. Suppose you found a lump of meat and kindly some extended. Old Regan crush it neat his feet and lecture you offended. If cherished you a fancy cheese, some gouda, Swiss, or bluer, would Regan dash and cheese he'd seize and toss it down the sewer. If have you honey in your tea and dare let Regan know it, as if avenging every bee right in your face, he'd throw it. Now, Regan weren't no hypocrite, professed he on and over, as poplar bark he chewed with grit and for dessert a clover. Now you picnic in the grass and pour a glad libation, poor Regan's absent for a glass. He perished of starvation. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Oh, yes, Brian. Oh, 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 See that man about that man. Hi. Right. Next, yeah. next, we've got Garrett Murphy. Oh, Garrett Murphy, a great What a segue. What a segue. What a segue. Tonight on the Lane Lane Show. Remember none too long ago when yeah. Seth Rogen and James Franco did the impossible and made entertainment of a plot to assassinate the leader in North Korea, and the populace rushed to the casting call to portray the revolutionaries who founded our nation, praying boo and bread the odds as they did record-making digital rentals. Oh, freedom of speech, they warble with burn, and they squalled why, oh, why did North Koreans get so mad? So now comes Kathy Griffin in the role of Judith with a chump as whole premise, and the populist rails to another casting call to play Joseph R. McCarthy, along with Lynch Mob preparing ropes, stakes, and more for Griffin to be a real life John Dark. A double standard portraying the double feature tonight on the Lame Lame Show. <laughs> Secret prerequisite for passing the Law and Enforcement Academy. Great. Congratulations to all your recruits. With the passage of our secret requirement, you have officially fulfilled all the tests for being able to call yourselves officers of the law. 
Let the outside world believe that what we mean by the special elite, that we mean toughening one's mind and body via basic training, or being proficient in hand-to-hand -hand combat, or being the crackest shot imaginable, it is really none of those things. Nor is it familiarity with police jargon, or military jargon, or how well you can handle our numerous types of armament, or even knowing your badge or serial number. The most uncanny and savvy among you manage to figure it out. It happens to be how well you can tell a tall tale. When that moves our allies in courts and politics to believe you. When you can tell how the target reached for your gun, or tried to assault you, or tried to threaten you and others. And you can now tell the most compelling story using an especially bright imagination. That rookies are what really makes a good law enforcer. You have passed with flying colors, and I am very proud of all of you. But just keep this in mind, officers. Real colors do not fly as gloriously as the ones you have just passed with. <laughs> the sinking tower of rhymes with Crisco. Like present day imitators of Yurta the Turtle, the city parents and developers did it this time. All they really had to do was to simply build a new transit center. But of course, who do we think we are? Anyone can build a simple transit center, but we're SNF, the city that really knows how. There's nothing, no nothing going higher than we. We'll build us a transit center capped by a building that will really help to fill us up to the stars. So they build up and build up and build up some more, and behold, that tower was built, a marvel of the ages. But what's that odd sound, that sinking sound, not quite the burping sound of a match, but equally ominous? It gasps for us out, and it's plainly clear that that tower has begun to sink like four hours into the earth. Those developers might have dared to rise to the stars, but it appears they may really sink to the fallen stars. They really should have known that to build up on sand, something up the gold or hourglasses, soul source and hubris of city leaders and builders. But you can never keep a big use of that for long. Hey, look on the bright side. At least we've done Italy a few better. They just have a leaning tower of pizza. But we, we have, ladies and gentlemen, the sinking tower of, uh, well, you know. <laughs> Gaia. Gaia, you're up. And followed by Bobby E., and then we're done. All right. I'll take care of these wonderful prizes designed, like I like to say, with your minds in mind. Wow, yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, there we go. Let's see. What's up? I have, well, an announcement. So, I'm going to be part of this Thousand Poets for Change, 100,000. Oh, wow. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. And, um, okay, so uh, Phil Packett asked me to feature. And what I'm thinking of doing is every year I used to do the annual exorcism of the money system. And I want to do it again this year. But I think it would be really cool to have a team like you and you. And so what I want to do is put together like a little kind of live theater thing if you all want to participate. And we'd basically be like burning stock exchange reports and throwing fits and exercising the money system. So if you're interested, let me know. I believe in teamwork and sharing features, and I really don't give a shit about it. But um, so what I did last time was I did the uh, sleep down in the fire, the Rage Against the Machine thing, and then Howl and something else. And people were like, oh my god, it's like a god or something. So I think we should have a team this time. If y'all want to do it, let me know afterwards. Um, I'm still here. I should be dead by now, but I keep living somehow. I have can I was like late stage cancer, and I came here to find a comprehensive cancer center, and somehow got pneumonia, which turned into bronchitis, which turned into I don't know what, but um, so I haven't been able to leave yet because I'm too sick to travel. <laughs> anyway, um, so I'm here, and I think I'm dead, but it's okay. That you know, I really after death. This is my theory: is after death is just as much fun as life. Yeah. You just kind of keep going on. So according to the doctors, I'm 80% cancer cells at this point, which actually. And it qualifies me as the living dead, which is kind of fun. <laughs> Alan is coming up. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, so this is my phone. Uh, what you need to know to understand this is there was a movie called Swimming to Cambodia. Um, I was uh, married to a man who was supposedly making uh, reverse engineering alien technology. Turns out he also made uh, non-lethal weaponry. Now he's a Navy SEAL. And we just love and hate each other, like you wouldn't believe. So, <laughs> This is my revenge because him and another partner of mine decided that the best way to keep track of me was to stick a tracking device up my butt during sex. And <laughs> I found out. <laughs> and you should see when I suck up his urethra. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, 
He deserved it. I, I saw another. I had the. I when I, every time I go to the ER, I get the, uh, you know, the uh, what are the IV needles. So <laughs> one must be scary to get money involved. Your destination. Oh, when when I travel, so these CIA guys and stuff they come around and they're like, "Whoa, what's your destination?" And I, you know, I'm like, "None of your freaking business." And I put on a wig and get off the train so that they can't find me. But um, so this is the question and this is the poem. Right here. This is, okay, it was one. It was the end of the movie Swimming to Cambodia. They get spinning in my mind. Now I know what killed Marilyn Monroe. Narrated over the din of the black helicopter blade separating those who would live from those who would die. Like my heart, when you told me we were, we were over because I couldn't get a security clearance. In security clearance, I yelled as he faded into oblivion. Me, those refugees left on the beach as the U.S. government abandoned Cambodia while the Cambodians remained because they wouldn't stoop to the level of coward nor abandon their people. Like you, mister, my job is more important than love. I know what killed Marilyn Monroe. Mafia boys getting laid who offered up the Kennedy to confess the Cuban Missile Crisis in the arms of a love goddess who had to die when... Let's see, who had to die when I couldn't find it? Okay, who had to die when the secrets needed hiding? Yeah, I know it killed Marilyn Monroe, but I am not your love goddess. I am death incarnate, the Alpha and the Omega, who could be your most orgasmic love or your worst freaking nightmare, Captain Kirk. When Adele says, that's all right, I'll find someone like you, I say, I want nothing but the worst for you, <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> you may be a Captain Kirk, but I am the Admiral of the USS Enterprise of the larger Magellanic Clouds. Well, okay, my cat was the, um, Angel Kitty was actually the Admiral, but nobody believes that because nobody thinks cats are smart. Um, anyway, <laughs> so, she died. Uh, you will obey me or you will obey me because it takes two babies to make a dream come true and I'm the one and but so are you and it takes two blah 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 blue. um world waiting world oh yeah okay. I just remember okay. I'm the one but so are you and it takes two to make this world wake up and I'll tune to the stars my destination your heart your soul your body my altar Alpha and Omega. Many hands weave light, Captain Kirk. Light becomes love. It's all you need, Captain Kirk. And that and you are my destination. Uh, again, for me, after about doing this exercise, I think this is the perfect crowd and perfect bunch to do it. Um, I'm going to torture you with the song. Oh, I'm done? Yeah, yeah, time. Okay, all right. But see her about this thing. It's a great, and uh, you're not, yeah. let, me, let me just show them that. I, I know several <laughs> people are going to be there, even me, so, and oh. she'll be there, so it's going to be good. Yeah. 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 This, you're, you're, this is not your first time here, right? I was here last week. Okay. Last week was my first time. Oh, did, did we memory? Hoot and holler, memory and scream and holler for you? A little bit, but it was a smaller crowd. No. Oh, well, let's treat them like we want to treat a newbie. Come on, dude. Let's go. Yeah. Please, and so is Louise, so don't hide arms, get side arms. Cynicism, substitute for optimism or realism. Focus on the shouldn't leads to indecision. Failure to act or mistakes cause self-derision. Point out the fault and maybe miss the point. Not sure which deity would presume to anoint a mortal to be capable of judging all the rest. A test to see if faced with immeasurable imperfection that one can keep oneself pointed in a progressive direction to grow and build a life in spite of all the things that don't seem right. Who is right? Who is right? Precisely. That's the problem, put concisely. Nothing can be objective. 
direction is only arbitrarily corrective, and for that matter, who's test? I forgot. When did it become a competition with all the rest? To put feathers in caps and righteousness in cells and metaphorical trophies, ribbons, medals, and report cards on shelves. Who cares? I'm better than anyone who dares to play the game that's all been fabricated in my head, whose rules will remain a hidden secret till I'm dead. So secret, in fact, I couldn't begin to understand them myself. Myself. Me. It all revolves around me. If I stay within myself, then I'm the only one who can hurt me, and the only one who can praise me. Guess how often I do either. Yeah, it doesn't sound very good to me either. But listen. If the negativity and harshness is directed only out at all the unsuspecting witnesses to this noiseless internal out, then there's no risk of friendly fire. Now you're a liar. That trajectory can't be maintained. An endless, infinite battle of one versus all won't be sustained with the resources at your disposal. A proposal. Try moving the center of the galaxy. Can't. It's a Herculean task. Won't. Don't know where to start. We'll step in place. Ask for help. But there's no one to trust. But you must. Now, trusting means giving and taking, and I don't want to lose anything important. You will lose. It's a foregone conclusion. Don't buy the illusion or sell the delusion that your happiest and best can't be taken away. If all I have to do is change, then all is lost. And there is nothing more. Set up for failure, a fight that can't be won. Honestly, I'm dishonest, not genuine nor kind, just scared and lonely and already missing what I haven't lost yet. Help? I've hated for so long it's normal. I hate others so I don't hate me, and if I hate them first they can't hate me back. Or who cares if they did anyways? Cynicism is a shield, sarcasm is sword. And riding some good fortune and luck I have arrived at a body of water where I must sink or swim. My tools that got me here are now burdens. I refuse to go along for the boat ride, in balance of pride. <coughs> Strength in numbers? Mine only counts to one. Anti-everything. Good for a laugh or a one-time conversation. No sustainable relation. Shit. Partnership. Mine's in trouble all of a sudden because I revealed a bit of weakness. Of honesty, I thought. Tough crowd. Better not do it again. Can't be trusted. Gotta get my shield. Wow. I, was, I was here last week and it was my first time here, but it was also my first time ever reading poetry in front of you guys. So um, I had a substitute here last week, so that's why I did yeah, that's yeah, what you, right. to me, you were new. So. Yeah. Um, so I wrote this one the morning after. It's called Dream. <laughs> I saw you in a dream, beautiful as ever, yet not the same. Comfortable, unrestrained, and straight to me you came. I took the chance to learn about you all I did not know, after only we were left and the lights were turned down low. I knew your face before, but not how it looks under the moon. I knew your lovely hair, but not the scent of its perfume or how it felt between my fingers when I moved it to uncover the eyes I thought I knew, gazing up at me as a long-lost lover. I knew the shape of your nose, but not how it would dent my cheek when you leaned in to whisper something this gentleman won't repeat. I knew your lips, but not their taste, only how much I love your smile. And when they parted, your tongue and mine met and danced a while. I know not how much I have to stoop to meet those soft warm lips and to bring you up to mine I know how hard, not very, I have to lift. I knew the curves of your body but not, not how it felt pressed against mine and your fingers but not how they tickled gently along my spine. Before we mingled in my dream, I wanted you before and knowing what I know now, I want you so much more. Almost too much to take, but thankfully enough to wait. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me. Well, let me see. Bobby. <laughs>
Yeah, you, you got you got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I want to do a little short one. Yeah. Bouncing over uneven hills, dripping, steaming, and wet. The heat is set to boiling, so we moisten further yet. Umbrella signals to others that your dryness ranks first. So no matter if you stab my face and cause my eyeball to burst. Rain is only water, but you think it harms us worse when you see all of the selfishness to avoid its gentle curse. I prefer to be in rain, giving puddles a righteous splash. But alas, I'm off to work inside and sit down on my ass. Rain is a good thing. It's a life-giving and pure. But in the city, it's a nuisance for which we seek a cure. We don't know anymore, we who dwell in the city, what is good for us, what's healthy, and what's pretty. We know culture and convenience, and what's comfortable, how to live with technology, but nothing natural. Rain reminds me of this, for when we could enjoy its fruits, we hide from nature's shower and protect our fancy suits. I've told my son that when it rains, daddies don't jump, don't jump in puddles. But I may be hasty in my claim, and my opinion has been muddled. We all should go enjoy a romp and get mud on our pants, because life is just not worth living if it's not okay to dance. Well, thank you, and I hope you enjoyed this. I, 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 I did. I, I enjoyed you. Um, these are the door prizes, which if you... Prizes, prizes, everybody got prizes. So this is actually, now that I had a chance to be, be sane about this, news from Native California, several interesting articles in there. Now this, talking about Native California, San Bruno Mountain, a great place to hike and wander through. And like I said, I had adventures and misadventures there. But this...